Hey guys, Joshua Neal here, and uh, today I want to try something a little bit different. Uh, I was having a discussion uh, in the comments of one of my videos with someone. Uh, they were commenting on uh, the tone I got when I recorded a uh, particular cover, and for that cover I happened to be using a pick. And uh, the, the person was asking me, um, or was saying, I really like the tone, uh, but I noticed you're using a pick on that. Is it possible to get that really bright, aggressive tone uh, when you're using your fingers? And my first reaction was, well, of course, you can certainly get uh, that kind of tone with your fingers. And I, I also, uh, I, I tend to be a finger style player if I have my preference, but I do use a pick for uh, certain lessons and certain songs if the bass player in that band uh, also happened to uh, use a pick. So I wanted to put together a little video for you guys where uh, I will actually uh, explain and show you how to get a very aggressive uh, modern cutting bass tone uh, while using your fingers rather than uh, having to resort to using a pick if you are a finger style player. So these are uh, things we're going to cover. Uh, going to teach you how to cut through the mix and really be heard and these are also uh, I want to make it a point to uh, do things that you can do without purchasing a new bass or without purchasing a new amp. Uh, simple things that you can do to help yourself cut through the mix. Uh, I will talk about um, things that you can do that do involve uh, buying or upgrading your bass or amps. So I'll, I'll talk about that at the end. But for now, we're going to talk about things that you can do without uh, without buying a new bass or without um, buying a new amp. So uh, a lot of the um, a, a lot of the bass that you hear in um, recorded music that doesn't cut through the mix, sometimes that's the fault of, of just the overall mix. Some bands actually make it a point to mix their bass very, very low so that it's almost just a rumble, it's just a presence rather than being uh, very, very audible. But uh, other times it's actually the bass player themselves that's um, at fault for uh, not cutting through the mix. So we'll talk about just a couple things that you can do to um, get yourself projecting, get yourself heard in the mix, especially in a live setting. Uh, if, you're, if it's a recording, you're going to have to make sure that the level of the bass is actually high enough that you can hear it. But uh, for practice, for live settings, things like that, there are a couple things you can do. One of the biggest things that you can do to um, help yourself out with your playing in general is to actually get your instruments set up. Now this is just adjusting the, uh, the tension of various things, the height, uh, the location of, of the strings, of the pickups, things like that, and um, this is one of the biggest things that, that i found that's been a, uh, a big help, is actually setting up your instrument for you and also setting it up for um, the type of music that you're playing. And there are four main um, uh, adjustments that you would make when you're, um, when you're uh, setting up your bass, and those are the truss rod, the string height at the bridge, the string height at the nut, and your intonation. Now the truss rod is the, uh, the actual relief of the neck. Uh, when you put uh, your strings on the bass, you attach them up at the headstock and you attach them down at the bridge. And uh, the strings are actually exerting an incredible amount of tension on the instrument and as sturdy as wood is, um, it, uh, it, it does have a tendency to, uh, to flex, to expand, to contract. And when you put the strings on the instrument, what's, what's actually happening is, is they're attempting to take the bass at the, um, the neck and at the body and actually fold it in half. And that's something that we do not want. Um, if you've ever seen a, uh, a harpsichord, which uh, typically is made all out of wood, uh, older harpsichords that have started to fall apart will actually fold in half under the tension of, of strings, and it's, it's, it's quite a sight if you've never seen it. Um, so what we do with modern guitars and modern basses is we have a piece of steel uh, or some other material actually inside the neck under the fingerboard called the truss rod, and what this does is it counteracts the tension of uh, the strings on the, uh, the neck and makes sure that the neck is properly level or actually properly slightly bowed uh, in order to make sure that the strings clear all the frets properly, that all of your notes come out uh, the right way, that they're not muffled, that they're not dead, things like that. Um, and uh, 
most modern bases at this point will have a, a truss rod. You can actually adjust the tightness or the looseness of the truss rod and uh, change the um, change the actual curvature of the neck. The this is the um, what's called the foundational adjustment. This is the thing that you want to adjust first before you go and toy with any of the um, the other parts of um, of the base because everything that you do is going to be based off of having your truss rod properly adjusted. Uh, the next thing you would adjust is the string height of the bridge. This is sometimes also called the action. If you take a look at the um, the saddles on your instrument, um, you can you'll notice they'll either have one screw or two screws sometimes, and you can actually use them to raise or lower uh, the saddle, which is in turn is going to raise or lower the uh, strings. And uh, typically, higher strings uh, are going to make the bass a little bit more uh, difficult to play, but they can also increase. Um, increase your sound because they're going to be putting a little bit more tension on the strings and lowering the action, lowering the strings is going to bring them down closer to the neck, uh, loosen them up a bit, make them a little easier to play, but it can also uh, reduce your, your overall sound. And again, there are things that we can do to compensate for that. The third one is the uh, string height at the nut. And this is where the strings leave the, um, leave the headstock and actually cross over that little piece of plastic or sometimes it's bone or graphite or brass. There's a ton of different nut materials that you can use. And this serves to guide the strings down the fretboard uh, in, at the proper spacing and actually feed them into the bridge in the proper way. Um, this is out of, out of all of the um, all of the adjustments that you can possibly make. Um, most of them you can do at home. The string height at the nut is the one that I would not recommend doing on your own unless you really, really know what you're doing um, because it involves actually taking uh, little circular files and actually filing parts of the nut down. And if you don't know what you're doing and you take too much off of the nut, um, the strings will no longer clear the first couple frets. You'll get constant buzz and dead notes, and there's, there's no way to actually fix that besides uh, shimming the nut, which involves putting a little bit of material under it to raise it back up, or worst case scenario, you actually have to uh, get a brand new nut, which is gonna run you about 50 to 80 bucks with the work, depending on uh, who you take it to. And the, um, the final thing that you can do is the intonation and this is the string length from the nut where the strings leave the nut and right where they enter the bridge at the saddles that's the string length and if the string length is not set properly what it can do is put all of uh, the notes over your frets actually out of tune or if you're using a fretless instrument it will move the notes away from where they're supposed to be located and just throw your your intonation and your tuning all out of whack so actually adjusting the um the length of the strings making sure that the notes are in the correct spot is is a, a huge benefit especially if you do a lot of um double stops playing two or or three or four notes at a time uh, if you're playing chord shapes you definitely want your bass to be in tune um, again the truss rod the string height at the bridge and the intonation. Uh, these are all things that you can learn to do at home. And there's actually a really cool series of videos uh, by a guy named John Carruthers who, who has been doing um, guitar and bass work for a number of different companies uh, for, for decades at this point. And he actually has a really cool little series where he shows you on a bass how to adjust the truss rod the height of the bridge, the height of the nut, and the uh, the intonation in a very um, very coherent and easy way to do it. So I'm actually going to post the link to uh, that playlist in the video description. So if you if you've been curious about uh, learning how to set up your instrument yourself, so that you can you can tinker with it and find the setup that you like, those are some great videos to get you started. Now if you're at all unsure about how to set up your instrument, absolutely take it to a qualified bass tech. There's definitely one in your area, especially if you live near a larger town or a major city. You can certainly find someone. Um, if even if you have like a large superstore near you, like Sam Ash or Guitar Center or something like that, those guys usually have a uh, a guitar technician on staff that you can uh, take your instrument to. And if if you go in and just ask them to set it up, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And um, 
something like that, depending on where you take it, is going to run you about uh, 25 to 50 bucks, again, depending on the guy you take it to. Um, if you need a list of uh, luthiers or technicians, somebody that can help you with that, uh, check out Best Base Gear. Uh, I will post the link to uh, their list as well. They keep a running list of um, active luthiers and um, base technicians in uh, in different states, near different towns, and you can find somebody that's close to you and uh, take it in and get it set up. Uh, with the setup, though, the, one of the most important things that you can do is make sure that the bass is set up for you, set up for the music that you want to play, not set up for the technician that did your setups. So there's no unified theory of bass setups at this point. There's no one solid setup that's going to work for absolutely everybody. So you want to make sure that you get the instrument set up for you and learning how to set up the instrument yourself um, is going to be a big part of that. You can start with the um, the standard setup and try it out for a bit and say, well, I like this part of the setup, but I don't like this part of the setup, so let me tweak this, lower this, raise this up, change the relief of the neck, whatever it is, and just keep uh, tooling with it until you find a specific setup that's uh, good for you. The, um, the tools that you actually use to set up the instrument, they're not terribly expensive. I mean, bare, bare minimum you need um, a, uh, a capo, a feeler gauge, uh, a couple hex keys, Allen wrenches, um, and um, that's screwdriver for the intonation. That's really about it, which uh, all of that together is going to run you about I don't know, 20, 30 bucks, depending on where you get, uh, where you get everything. Um, so if you do want to uh, learn how to do it, again, check out those videos from John Carruthers. I'll post the link and you can start learning how to do the setup. But uh, a poor setup is going to greatly impact your tone and the speed at which you can play and the comfort level. Um, especially you get, if you're getting up there on stage, you're going to be thrashing around, banging your head, rocking out. Um, you're already working very hard. You don't want to be working doubly hard trying to play an instrument that's not comfortably set up for you. So absolutely, if you've never had your bass set up, go get it set up. It's going to make a world of difference, I promise. Now the next thing that's really going to help out is the type of strings that you use to get this aggressive modern style bass tone. Um, the biggest thing you can do is make sure that you have new strings or newer strings on your instrument. Once the strings get older, they get caked with oil and dead skin cells and other gross disgusting things. They, if your strings have been on there a really long time, you might even have that, that green uh, discoloration on there and that means it's absolutely time to change your strings but as they get old they start to die they're not as as bright and uh, they get very lifeless no amount of tone shaping or or anything else you can do is going to fix that so if you if your strings are starting to get old absolutely get some brand new strings now the type of strings that you want to use brand I'll, I'll talk about brands in a second but the actual style of the string is going to be what you're looking for you want to be using what's called a round wound type of string and uh, bass strings or guitar strings in general are really just a core of something and they can be round shaped or hex shaped or, or uh, ribbon shaped or any number of those things but uh, round wound strings are going to be wrapped with a round wire around them and um, these types of strings have a much more uh, forward biting bright kind of tone that you don't get with the other most common type of strings which are called flat wounds. Um, flat wounds are more common in um, older R&B, jazz, some funk music, especially finger style funk. They have a much warmer, rounded, um, less biting tone. and. Um, in the beginning when metal was first becoming prevalent we would we were still hearing these kinds of strings if you've ever heard old black sabbath records um where geezer butler has that really um muted kind of woofy uh bass tone that that he was getting those are uh either very very old strings or more likely flat wounds because again we hadn't really um figured out exactly what we needed yet he was he was kind of making it up as he went along um, so if, now if that's the kind of tone that you're going for, if you want that older, um, classic metal tone or even classic rock tone, you may want to consider a, 
uh, a flat wound or something similar to a flat wound string in order to get that. But um, if you're looking for that bright, aggressive, modern metal tone, you're going to want what are called round wound strings. Now, if you're not sure, or if you're going to be shifting between gigs that call for a more traditional tone and gigs that call for a more uh, modern tone, you can consider uh, a type of string which is called half round, which uh, I know Diodario makes a half round. I think some other companies make them as well, but they're a, um, they're a round wound string. They actually build a round wound string, but then they take the string and they actually grind down the outer coating so that, or the outer part of the wire so that it feels more like a flat wound string. It kind of uh, smooths out the tone a little bit, but since it's still a round wound string, it's still bright. So it's a good compromise between the, the warm muffled flat wounds and the bright biting uh, round wound strings. Now, as far as brands, um, I can only speak for the type of strings that I like or the brands of strings that I like. And, and above and beyond, my favorite string brand is DR. Um, specifically, their, um, uh, the strings are called Fat Beams, or they're actually the, the Marcus Miller uh, signature strings. And um, at, at this point, they're the best ones I've found. They have uh, the best mix of uh, low and high end. Some strings tend to, or a lot of strings I've played, tend to favor either one or the other. They either have really good lows, but they're not very clear, or they have these really bright, biting highs, but they're incredibly thin in the low end. And the Marcus Millers, the Fat Beams, are the ones that I've found that actually manage to blend the two together. So they're, they're just an awesome all-around string for anything that you're going to be doing, at least in the, in the round wound category. Um, the only issue I have with DR strings is that they are very expensive compared to other bass strings. Um, anytime that I've strung up my uh, six string and I wanted to put the DR Marcus Millers on them, those sets run about 40, 45 bucks, which is, which is pretty darn high for uh, bass strings. Uh, if money is a factor, and for a lot of us it often is, um, a good, for my money, follow-up to DRs are, are the Diodarios. Um, they make a whole bunch of, of different strings out there. They make the, um, the half rounds I was talking about. Um, if you're looking for a bright, round-wound string to be using, then um, you're looking at either the, the nickel wounds, not the pure nickel, you want the nickel wounds, um, which still have the steel core, which is gonna give you that bright sound. Or if you want an incredibly bright, um, actually for, uh, for, for my purposes, often too bright a sound, um, you're looking at the pro steels, which is just as bright as they come in uh, the Diodario line. Um, and then going further down from that, I'd say my third favorite string, and it's really more of a, of a if I'm really, really running out of money and I need new strings, I will get uh, Ernie Balls. They, they work, they get the job done. They're, they're very affordably priced. A, a pack of uh, Ernie Balls is gonna run you about 16, 17 bucks, which is great for bass strings. Um, I've noticed that they don't last as long as uh, the DRs or the Diodarios, even with proper maintenance, even with wiping them off and cleaning them and uh, shining them up and all of that stuff. Um, and just the sound of them is not exactly what I'm looking for. To me, they sound a little off. But if I need new strings in a pinch and I don't have a lot of money, um, the Ernie Balls are one that, that uh, I will go with. Um, on top of that, we've talked about uh, looking at new strings and especially round wound strings. The other important thing is going to be to pick the correct gauge of string. Um, gauge is just a measure of the, the thickness of the strings. Um, and this is going to, a lot of this is going to depend on uh, personal preference, the, the types of strings or the size of the strings that you like. The, the common Four string gauges that you see are um, 45 to 105, which is actually what I just put on um, my four string as well. It's just 45, 65, 85, 105 down to the E string. Um, there's also a slightly lighter one that I occasionally use, which is 45, 65, 80, 100. So slightly lighter gauge E and A string. Um, for standard tuning, I, I feel it comes down to personal preference, which um, 
uh, which size of string you particularly like, the, the way that you like to set your string height, the kinds of things you're going to be doing with the strings. But uh, if you're going to be tuning way, way down, uh, especially on a four string, if you're gonna be going down to like drop C, drop B, um, if you're gonna be doing the death core thing and you're going all the way down to you know drop A, drop G, drop F, that kind of thing, um, you may want to consider a higher gauge of string. Um, the thicker the string, the, the more tension it's gonna be able to retain and the, the better it will be able to project those low, low pitches with some amount of clarity. Now granted, when you get down to drop A, drop G, that kind of stuff, um, you, you start leaving the realm of, of actual discernible notes and you get into just low, rumbling noise and presence just just beefing up the sound but if you want to give yourself the best chance of um, being heard clearly you're going to want to look at a, a higher gauge of string now a lot of companies again dr i'm going to mention because i love them they actually make a line of um, strings that are specifically designed for drop to, drop tuning they're called drop down tuning strings or ddt they have a little spider on the cover. Um, I've used them on uh, guitar. I haven't used their bass strings, but they, uh, the way they're constructed, the way I understand it, is they actually build them with just a much, much larger core as compared to a, um, a string of comparable gauge and then a thinner wrap. So it still comes out the same size as uh, a standard string, but it's a much, much larger core, so it's better able to accommodate those low, low tunings. Um, they tend to feel very stiff and, and almost unplayable when they're used in standard tuning, but as soon as you um, go for the drop tunings and, and lower the tension on them, they, they manage to retain the feeling of standard tuned strings even when they're in a drop tuning. They don't get all, uh, they don't get all floppy. Um, which brings me to my next point. Uh, I personally actually, I, I like the loose feel of standard gauge strings when they're down tuned. I like how they, they get much easier to play, they get much easier to bend, um, and I like the, the, the clickety clack, the fret noise that I get when I'm playing these very down tuned strings uh, that are standard gauges. So this is not a, a hard and fast rule, not an absolute rule that if you're going to be tuning way, way down, you absolutely have to get thicker gauge strings. It's entirely your personal preference. You can always uh, raise up your action, raise up your string height, actually set up the instrument again um, in order to accommodate that. Definitely, if you're going to be in a lower tuning all the time, like say if you're going to be on a four string and you want to be playing in drop A on a four string, I would make sure that you set up the instrument for that lower tuning, actually redo the truss rod and the string height and the intonation and all of that so that everything is is good to go. If it's an occasional, like for one song, you're gonna drop it way, way down and then bring it back up, um, you can either just deal with um, the looseness of it or um, you can kind of split the difference between your preferred action setting, truss rod settings, and the one that would accommodate the down-tuned uh, strings, but again, entirely up to you at this point. Um, the next thing that you can do besides getting the instrument set up and using the proper strings, using the round-wound, aggressive-sounding strings, is we need to put a little bit of tone shaping on our, on our bass. We need to actually, um, the tone we need to send to the amp needs to be one that's going to accommodate this or at rather give us this cutting, biting style of tone. Um, and the um, most common thing that you can do for that is actually use a little overdrive or a little distortion. This is going to increase the, uh, the upper part of the, uh, the harmonic content of your bass and it's gonna really help you cut through the mix. I know it seems like it wouldn't help you cut through the mix because your guitar players are also running an incredible amount of distortion and you're thinking, well, I need to keep my sound clean so that I don't get you know, buried within the wall of distorted guitars, you know, the, 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 the Mesa Boogie Assault or the, or the PV5150 that, that everybody's running. Um, but a little overdrive or a little distortion with, uh, with your sound is actually gonna really help you push out into those frequencies that you don't normally occupy and it's going to help you be much better heard in the mix even in the recorded mix and the live mix and anything it's going to really help out um, in my experience the best 
bet for achieving this sound is to actually get a preamp, which is going to shape, modify, boost your tone um, before it actually gets to the amp, hence pre, uh, preamp. Now again, most, most uh, combination amplifiers, like the, the big heads you get, are um, gonna have, they'll have a preamp in them and then they'll have a power amp to boost the, singles, the signal and blah, blah, blah. Um, but there are little um, tone shaping rack mount units and also just pedals that can help you push through it. And um, for my money, the, the best one that I've used so far is this guy the Tech 21 Sans Amp. Um, absolutely love this thing. It's, I, I often call it, it's, it's idiot proof metal tone in a box. Even if you set this thing just flat, and I think I know I still have it set for uh, whatever I was doing last. Um, even if you set it kind of flat, it still sounds really, really good. Uh, the things I like about it are um, definitely this guy right here, the drive knob, which allows me to add or reduce the amount of overdrive in my sound depending on what i'm doing i can go from just a little bit of grit down at the nine o'clock to to full-on uh doom metal fuzz all the way at the uh the five o'clock position i like that i have a presence knob that i can choose how much of my this is really just kind of a a, a super high boost um really boosts up the very high frequencies gives you that that sparkle to your sound and um something that uh, I like, especially if I've put new strings on or newer strings on, I may not want as much presence, so I'm gonna lower it a bit. If um, my strings are starting to get a little old and or I want just a very bright, um, almost harsh kind of sound, I can really roll up the presence and um, get exactly what I'm looking for. I've got a blend knob, which allows me to control how much of the affected signal the sans amp is actually pushing out so i can keep a little bit of dry in there if i want typically when i record i go all the way full full wet signal full affected signal um but uh live sometimes i'll toy with it and uh i've got the bass and treble eq knobs and the cool thing about the sans amp uh and i'll probably do a a full demo on this uh a little bit later but um with the the bass and the treble adjustments as you raise the bass and the treble knobs it uh, adaptively cuts the mid-range and if you lower the bass and the treble knobs it actually adaptively boosts the mid-range so it's it's inversely proportional to the bass and the treble um, boosting up the bass and the treble with the mids cut is is what gives you that smile curve that you often see a lot on uh, graphical eqs um, a lot of guys will tell you that the smile curve is is bad tone and those people are wrong um you see a lot of slap players as well that use this particular um uh curve as well to really boost up their lows so that the rump you can feel the bass and also boost up the highs so that the the upper transients come out so that you can really hear that attack of the strings um so uh again for my money uh, with uh, my money being about 200 bucks, I think this cost me. Uh, this is a great way to get metal tone without really having to think about it. And the last tour I did, I'm going to put this down. Last tour I did, um, I think four out of five bass players were using uh, a Sans amp uh, in some capacity. And it just, uh, I've even seen people just bring their bass and the Sans amp for. Uh, large gigs because it is also kind of a cabinet modeler. You don't really need an amp. You can go, if, if you've got the right PA, you can go right through the SANS amp, direct out into the board, have the sound guy send some uh, monitor signal back at you so you can actually hear the bass, and then you don't need this gigantic cabinet um, cluttering up the stage that you have to carry and load into the damn van and all of that stuff. Uh, one of the other very common... Um, bass preamps is uh, made by radial it's called the bass bone and one of the reasons i didn't consider it initially is because it didn't have an overdrive circuit and i really need that overdrive circuit to help me cut through the mix and uh, recently they came out with a bass bone that has an overdrive circuit it's called the bass bone od um, one of the cool things about it is it's actually a two channel preamp so if you want to have a clean tone and a distorted tone and be able to switch between them on the fly, you can do that. If you want to run two instruments with two different tones at the same time, 
you can do that or if you want to switch between different bases and they need different settings you can do that with the base bone um, but the price is going to jump from there when i looked it up uh, yesterday the base bone od cost about 350 bucks um, which is as much as the rack mount version of the sans amp incidentally do not get the rack mount version of the sans amp um, i don't know what it is unless you need to be switching between multiple tones that's something you can do with the rack mount sans amp you can have i think three uh, pre-programmed uh, tones that you can switch with a foot switch unless you absolutely need that avoid the rack mount version i don't know what it is but it just doesn't sound the same as the pedal um, and it's also again about 350 bucks so save yourself some money um, get the sans amp pedal if you're going to be doing metal tone um, the bass bone, the one I was talking about a second ago, I've seen mostly used by um, funk and fusion and jazz guys, especially guys who like to switch between electric and upright in the middle of the set. They can have their two different tone settings for the electric and the upright and switch between them. Um, failing a, uh, a preamp, if a preamp is out of your budget, and that's um, very, very possible, you might be able to find them used, but uh, if, uh, you already have, say, an overdrive pedal, and two of the more common ones are the uh, Boss Bass Overdrive, the ODB3. I used this one for a long, long time, or the uh, one that I upgraded to, the Electro Harmonix uh, Bass Big Muff Pi. These are also great for adding a little, just a little bit of fuzz to your sound. Um, if you're gonna get one of those, or if you have one of those, um, make sure that it's something that has a wet dry control. Sometimes it's called wet dry, sometimes it's called a blend knob. It controls the amount of um, clean tone to, or the ratio of clean to distorted. And uh, with, with the bass overdrive pedals, at least the older ones like the, the ODB3, um, when you go full overdrive, um, they, are, they have a tendency to suck out the low end from your sound and um, just just bad things in general happen. So you wanna be able to leave a little bit of the clean tone in there. It's a problem I haven't noticed with the Sans Amp. The Sans Amp sounds awesome even when it's full on uh, distorted, but the the Boss pedal and the Big Muff pedal can get a little, uh, a, a little uh, not good. <laughs> they can um, lose a lot of the low end when you uh, when you really crank them up but the the uh, the bass big muff and the odb3 have a wet dry knob the um, big muff actually has a switch where you can introduce uh, an equivalent amount of dry signal into the um into the tone or it's actually got a bass boost which i noticed really took took care of um the loss of low end it kind of artificially introduced a little bit of low end back into the sound um, the newer big muff the the really big one the deluxe i think it's called that just came out um, actually has a actually has a blend knob on it so you can fully control how much is in there and it's got like a cross a crossover and uh, a high pass and all of that stuff so they're really trying to address the loss of low end signal this is if you talk to to uh, working bass players that that uh, need to use an overdrive here and there you get the same complaint every single time I really like the sound of overdrive but it sucks the low end out of my sound so I have to do this you know I, I have to a b my signal into two different amps and have a clean one and a distorted one so I don't lose the low end and it's a whole big hassle and yada yada um, they're getting better with addressing those kinds of concerns but the um, so we've talked about uh, we've talked about the setup, actually setting up your instrument. We've talked about the strings as well, the things that um, you can um, things that you can do to uh, uh, help out your sound, and the actual um, front end of the amp, the preamp, the overdrive, that kind of thing. But now I'm actually going to um, talk about the. Uh, the right hand technique, and this is going to be as, uh, one of the biggest things that you can do to really improve your um, heavy metal tone is actually be using your right hand properly, be picking the strings properly for metal sound rather than a traditional sound. So I'm actually going to zoom in, I'm going to grab my bass, and I'm going to show you just real quick um, how to actually get that tone to project. All right, so now we'll actually talk about the right hand technique for getting this uh, aggressive 
modern metal bass tone. Uh, the one thing that you definitely want to avoid is the traditional way of playing with your right hand, what's sometimes called the back breaking technique, which is where you pull through the string and allow the lower string or your thumb to actually catch it. You're pulling across the string like this. That kind of thing. And I am uh, recording through uh, the Sans amp at this point and I do already have it set for the um, the modern metal bass tone. So there is a lot of drive in my sound, but but you get the idea. And this particular kind of technique um, is, is great if you're doing funk or R&B or uh, older styles of music where you want that, that fatter, rounder, uh, bassier sound. But in, in this particular case, that's not what we're going for. We don't really want to fatten up our sound. We want it to be bright. We want to project and cut through uh, the mix. So, um, and also this has the, the uh, added detriment of really slowing you down. This kind of technique takes a lot of energy to get through the strings, so we're, we're going to avoid that. What we want to do is keep our fingertips directly over the string rather than behind it like this. We want to keep it directly over the string, uh, over the pickup if possible, so that we actually have a, a backstop, and that's going to be uh, apparent why in just a moment. Um, rather than pulling through the string, we're actually going to come straight at the string like this. We're going to wind up and essentially we're going to punch. We're going to punch into the string with our fingertip and then we're going to immediately get away from it. So instead of this traditional back breaking pull through technique, we're going to just punch right at the string and then immediately get off it. And what this does is it causes the strings to actually bounce off the metal frets or bounce off the fingerboard if you're using a fretless instrument. It's very similar to the slap bass technique. And you can actually hear if I do a little bit of slap and this uh, punching style. You can hear they're very, very similar, but it's it's causing um, the, the, the sound of my strings, especially my my... Uh, fingerboard noise, my string noise, to really just jump out, and it's this metal-on-metal metal contact sound that's uh, going to give you the the cut that you want. That's going to really help you project through uh, project through the mix and um, cut through, be be heard, as well as if not better than uh, your guitar players. And the added bonus of this particular technique is that you're not going to have nearly as much drag because you're not pulling through or across the string, you're just bouncing off it. It's gonna take a lot less energy, which is gonna allow you to play um, faster and also allow you to play for longer without getting exhausted. So just to demonstrate, um, since I was, uh, I was listening to Anthrax earlier today, I'm gonna to play a little bit of uh, the main riff from Caught in a Mosh. I'm gonna do it the traditional finger style, and then I'm going to do the uh, modern metal punching style and I want you to uh, just listen to it so that you can hear the difference. So here is that main riff with the traditional style. So that's not bad. I mean I am getting a little bit of, uh, of, of finger noise because I, I have brand spanking new strings on here. This is the first thing I've played on them. And uh, I'm also, my action is very, very low. So I'm getting a lot of fret noise no matter what. But um, it doesn't quite have that, that aggressive punch that we're looking for. Now I'm gonna play the same riff again with the punching style and you will absolutely hear the difference. Here we go. And that definitely, if you've listened to that song before, that's that's exactly what Frank Bello sounds like when he's playing. And if you even watch him when he's playing, he's doing this uh, aggressive punching technique. And if, if you watch a lot of uh, good extreme metal bass players, uh, Frank Bello, um, Derek Engman from Cattle Decapitation, 
uh, who else? Don Slater from uh, Battlecross, those types of guys. JB from uh, Aborted, who are all fingerstyle bass players. You'll see that they do this very aggressive punching fingerstyle playing. So again, just to recap, we do not want to pull through the strings. Do not pull through strings. That's going to fatten up your sound. It's going to slow you down. Keep your fingers directly over the strings, over the pickup to use them as a backstop if possible. You want to wind up and just punch the string with your fingertip and then immediately get off it. So it's just a glancing blow across the strings. This is going to make the string bounce off the frets. Very similar to slap playing. That metal on metal contact is going to give you that cutting biting sound that you're looking for. It's also going to reduce drag, reduce the amount of energy that you're using so that you can play much, much faster. So there's the actual uh, technique, the actual right hand technique that you can use to get that, um, get your sound to just really jump out of the mix. Now before we wrap it up, um, I'll talk briefly about uh, the things that you can do or the things that, that I like to do that do involve getting a new bass or upgrading your bass or getting a new amp or, or all of that stuff. The things that cost a lot of money instead of just a little bit of money. Um, the bases, or rather the, the wood that your base is made out of, is going to uh, make a big difference in allowing you to project. A lot of guys for this kind of tone like to use um, maple instruments, either a maple body or a maple neck and fingerboard, or sometimes just the whole shebang, uh, maple on maple on maple, uh, it, which is a, just a very bright, forward, punchy wood. Uh, that can really help you cut through the the mix. I personally, at least on my um, my four string, I tend to go for the um, the harder woods, the the African hardwoods. I really like the sound of those. The um, the four string that you just saw me using um, that is a it's an aftermarket neck. It's a warmoth, but the neck is made of bubinga, which is the the hardwood that uh, Warwick makes a lot of their bases out of uh, bubinga, and then the other one. Uh, that you see a lot is Wenge. Um, very, very similar in, in color, tone color and, and actual physical color. Um, but those, those woods tend to add a lot of, of just very present lows and some really uh, biting mid-range that helps you cut through. And I couple that with an ebony board. Now, when I actually purchased the ebony board or I purchased the neck with the ebony board, it was because uh, I had been playing a lot of upright bass and I really wanted that kind of feel on the neck uh, just like I had on the upright bass. I like, I like the, the, the feel of ebony, but ebony also adds a lot of uh, the high transients into your sound. So that bubinga that covers the lows and the mids and the uh, ebony board that covers the highs really helped me to get that uh, projecting kind of sound that I was looking for. I also, um, I, at this point, I switch out the pickups on my basses always. Um, I like very high output, very bright, very aggressive pickups just in general, um, even for the, um, the, the other things that I do. I don't, I don't just play metal. Um, I, I, I do actually work uh, in, in a couple other fields, um, and I really like uh, EMG pickups uh, quite a lot for, for the, just the sound that they get, um, the, the ease of installation. They're, um, they're just a great pickup. They're not terribly expensive. Um, a set of the, like the four string J pickups is going to run you about a hundred bucks. Um, and that can be a great way to get this, the, the very aggressive bright tone you're looking for. They also have uh, a bunch of sound samples on their website, so you can go and check them out and, um, actually listen to what all the pickups sound like and you can decide for yourself if that's the sound you like or uh, most of the other major pickup manufacturers will do sound samples as well so you can get an idea of of what they sound like and if it's for you and then the last thing would be uh the amp that you're using f um for my money for a lot of people's money again that uh that tour i did um most of the bass players, myself included, were using uh, Ampeg as their gear. We all had the Ampeg head. I mean, I use the the SVT7, which is a um, it's a newer one. It's actually got a Class D power amp, which is um, 
much much lighter it's not it's it's tubes in the front and then it's solid state in the back so it sounds like a tube but it doesn't weigh 150 million pounds um i actually had to help one of the other bass players uh, a couple times move he was using the svt4 which is the big dog the one that pushes like 3,000 watts uh, and is made up of all tubes. That thing weighs like 55 pounds. Um, and f especially if you've been rocking out all night, it is no longer a one man job to move it. So uh, that was part of why I picked the seven. I wanted something that I could lift and move on my own. Um, but we were also all going into Ampeg cabinets and the two most common that I've seen uh, in that field for metal work is the six by 10, which is what I use and the eight by 10, which is the big brother of the six by 10. Um, the number up front represents how many speakers. So a six by 10 has six speakers and an eight by 10 has eight. And then the second number is the size of the speaker that it contains, which uh, for the 10 is a 10 inch speaker. So the 610 cabinet has six 10 inch speakers and the eight by 10 has eight 10 inch speakers. Um, 10 inch speakers being smaller, they don't push as much low end as the other guys. Uh, they're, they're very good for clarity. I really like tens for actually uh, punching through the mix and being heard. Um, the, uh, the other one that you see a lot of guys use are the, um, the 15s, which is just a big monster speaker. Um, the little um, cabinet, you can't see it, but the little cabinet that I use for a lot of my videos uh, is an Ampeg uh, 1x15. And that's just one big 15. It's got an incredible amount of low. It sounds awesome, but it's not terribly clear. So um, if you ever, if you get to the point where you say, well, I really like the clarity of the 10s, but I really like the rumble of the 15s, um, you can actually mix and match. You can get a, I, I see a lot of guys do a, a 2x10 or a 4x10 uh, into a 1x15. And most large um, amp heads, I know the Ampeg does it, but I think uh, SWR and uh, really anything else you're going to get can do this as well. You can actually power two cabinets off of the same head as long as you check the ohms. I'm not going to get into that because it's incredibly confusing and I don't completely understand it myself. Um, but you can run a cabinet full of 10s and a cabinet full of 15s and you can get the best of both worlds. So again, uh, the, the woods that your base is made out of, the pickups that you're using, and the, um, the uh, amp that uh, you put all of this good stuff through, um, you will uh, will be able to uh, also help you get that aggressive modern tone. But again, those things are going to cost a little bit more money. But keeping your instrument set up properly, using uh, round wound strings and the correct gauge, getting a good preamp or a good overdrive distortion pedal is going to really help you out and actually uh, attacking the strings with that uh, modern playing style uh, is, is going to be one of the biggest things that will actually help you project through the mix and actually be heard over those freaking guitar players. <laughs> so um, that is going to do it for me. I uh, hope you enjoyed this discussion about aggressive modern, modern bass tone. If you did, be sure to click like and let me know. You can also leave me a comment, your thoughts on what you do to get an aggressive modern bass tone. I'm sure there are some of you out there that uh, know things that I don't know. I'm always learning new things and I always love to learn new things. So if you have a tip for um, how you get that aggressive tone or how you get your tone, be sure to leave it in the comments so that we can all share in the knowledge. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any future updates. I've always got song lessons and covers and these technique and theory type videos that I'm starting to do. Um, and, uh, that will be it. So until next time.